Tom Anito's time as mayor may be over, but his unprecedented 20 years in office has earned him a place in Boston history alongside the likes of Red Sox legend Ted Williams. We all remember Williams as the greatest hitter to play the game. His silky smooth swing belied a complicated and difficult personal life. That's the story former Boston Globe editor Ben Bradley started working on shortly after Williams' death. Little did he know it would take a decade to bring us the kid, the immortal life of Ted Williams. Bradley joins us in a moment, but first, a quick look back at Williams' remarkable career. That's so pitchers, Williams swings, there's a high drive, going deep, deep, it is a home run. Tall and lanky, the kid could hit. Ted Williams made that perfectly clear in his rookie season, batting 357 and leading the American League with 145 runs batted in. And that was just the start of a remarkable 19-season career, all of them with the Red Sox. His 1941 season remains unsurpassed, finishing with a 406 average. He would lose nearly five years to the military, serving as a Marine Corps pilot in both World War II and again in Korea. Back on the field, Williams dueled famously with the great Joe DiMaggio. Williams was arguably the better hitter, but it was DiMaggio who would lead his Yankees to nine World Series rings. The man with the hot bat could be famously cold. He couldn't stand criticism, dismissing sports reporters as knights of the keyboard. He could be ornery with fans, notorious for never tipping his cap to the crowd. In the final at-bat of his career, he fittingly belted a home run, number 521. Fenway erupted, begging for a curtain call. But Williams just disappeared into the dugout, and John Updike famously observed, gods do not answer letters. That wouldn't come until the 1999 All-Star Game. It was then that an 80-year-old Ted Williams finally tipped his cap to the crowd. That's the Ted Williams we all knew, but in the new biography, Hitting Shelves Tomorrow, we see a different side. Ben Bradley Jr. worked as a reporter and editor at the Boston Globe for 25 years before going on leave to write the 800-plus profile. And Ben Bradley is here. And I'm pleased to say I, I read eight-tenths of it. I, I, I couldn't take it with me on the airplane, Ben. It was no, you do too your heavy. Homework. I did do my homework. You talk about, you start the book with that cryonics thing, that, that body being freezing, and, and you had actually said to the family that you didn't want to focus on that, but you kind of had to deal with that right away because it was such a b bizarre ending to such a fantastic life. Well, I thought that uh, that was people's last memory of Ted. Uh, they probably remembered that, that uh, uh, dark and bizarre cryonics episode. And um, I wanted to deal with it, and um, I got uh, a lot of new, a lot of new material on it, and um, uh, the, uh, Ted's daughter Claudia told me for the first time what she says happened and how uh, Ted did agree to it. She said, "My reporting suggests that if he did agree, uh, he probably wasn't of sound mind at the time, and later had doubts after agreeing." Yeah, after and, uh, reading your book, Ben, and that whole section on the pact, which was that bizarre handwritten note where they, the three of them, Ted and two of his kids, agreed to be frozen in this bizarre way at, at that Alcor thing, it looked like a hoax to me. It looked like totally bogus, and I kind of thought that's where you were leading me to. No. Well, yeah, it, this was a this was a note um, that uh, Claudia says they signed in uh, November of 2000, about a year and a half before Ted died. And um, she said that this was something that they wanted to do together and that they wanted to be together forever. And, um, but um, it, the, I, I, I have my doubts that, yeah. that that's a real uh, note. Perhaps it was built around an existing Ted Williams signature and uh, it was kept, uh, this was hardly a notarized legal document, it was kept in John Henry the son's car for 18 months and collecting oil stains and uh, they say that they never intended for it to go public uh, that it was just a family mm. deal but 
You know, when, and there's a little pull quote I took out of the, near the last uh, couple of chapters of the book, and, and you wrote this about the pact, and you said, the sad cryonics coda showed that Ted reaped what he sowed as a father and underscored the fact that Williams never fully escaped the family dysfunction that had ensnared him as a boy. I got the chills reading the story about his mother was obsessed with the Salvation Army, the father was a ne'er-do-well alcoholic, the brother, Danny, just like fell into the abyss, you know, largely because of the fame of his brother. But, I mean, dysfunction hardly begins to describe it. Ted was almost a feral child. Um, he was one of the original latchkey kids, really, he and his younger brother, Danny. His mother was a Salvation Army zealot out until all hours of the night uh, in Depression-era San Diego saving souls. And um, that's what she considered her primary mission in life. And um, Ted and, and uh, his younger brother came second. They'd be sitting on the doorstep at 10, 11 o'clock at night and waiting for uh, someone to cook them dinner. And uh, luckily for Ted, there was a playground down the street, and he played baseball under the lights, and uh, that was his, his salvation. And the father did support that. The father realized, recognized that the kid had some talent. Yeah, but he was never around to really encourage it. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't come back into the picture until ten, Ted uh, signed a pro contract. Then he wanted a piece of the action, the father. Mm. I was also touched by the fact that you said that he was innately kind, that he spent a lot of time doing charity work, you know, visit sick kids in hospitals, and he didn't want any publicity over that. Right. You know, if, if, right. if a sports, one of the sports reporters who he did have a bad relationship with and followed him, he, he didn't want his picture taken. Right. He was just, he was a, a good soul. Right. That, 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 that was genuine. I mean, Ted struggled with, uh, with anger. And um, he was able to channel it constructively on the ball field. And he would manufacture feuds with mm -hmm. the writers, and that would help him to go on tears and hit 500 for a couple of months. And he always said he, he uh, played better angry. But in his personal life, his private life, his anger uh, caused him great problems, and it would bubble up in inappropriate times. And, you know, he went through three marriages quickly and um, struggled in dealing with uh, his children. You know, one of the things about the anger that really struck me that you said is that he never argued a call. And I thought, wow, I mean, somebody who had so much pent up anger and was constantly flipping off the sports reporters and others, that he never argued a call. Well, he liked the umpires, and the umpires liked him. Uh, because they respected his uh, his batting eye, and um, there's a wonderful story, perhaps apoc apocryphal, um, where a catcher turns to uh, mildly complain uh, about a call, and the, the ump says to the catcher, "Mr. Williams will let you know when your pitcher throws <laughs> a strike." <laughs> He was also something of a progressive. He, he, he argued for the Negro League to be included in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. He was supportive of Jack. I mean, he, he wanted to have an integrated ball team. Well, that, that came out in 1966 when he uh, was inducted into the Hall of Fame. And surprisingly, as part of his, his acceptance speech, gave a very political speech, which is very unusual for a ball player where he called on the lords of Cooperstown to allow in the old Negro League players. And uh, it was a very interesting uh, statement. He was compassionate and fair. And of course, he was Mexican-American, which is a very little known fact. Um, his mother was Mexican, and it didn't emerge uh, to become public knowledge until about a, a month before he died. And this was something that he covered up his entire life because he was afraid of prejudice of the day, which pr probably wasn't as great uh, against Mexicans as it was against the, the mm -hmm. black players. But still, he was concerned that it would um, harm his career, so he kept it under wraps until much later in life. So you were there in the <clears throat> ballpark as a little kid, of course, when that infamous incident happened where he flung the bat, he was annoyed, something went wrong, and he flings the bat and it hits this, you know, little old lady. Yep. He that was, was so upset. That he was. That was one of the, the low moments of his career. He he'd, uh, had a rare strikeout, and he got so he says he was a perfectionist, and he got so upset that he went to fling his bat. He intended to throw it on the ground, but it had the rosin, and it stuck to <laughs> his hand, and it went sailing into the box seats and hit this old lady, and she was bloodied, and it, oh, it looked bad, and he was mortified. Did you see it from I where you were? I was there, yeah. yeah. And um, 
<laughs> I, I love the story. Bud Collins, the old mm. uh, Globe uh, tennis writer, then was a Cub reporter for the Herald. He goes running into the clubhouse and goes up to Joe Cronin, who was then the, the general manager, and said, Jesus, Joe, this doesn't look good. Uh, look at the old lady, bloody, she's going to sue the team. Oh, there'll be no lawsuit, says Cronin, very definitively. How do you know, says Collins? Because this woman happens to be my housekeeper, and oh. she loves Ted Williams. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Well, Ben, I love the book, The Kid. Um, good for Christmas presents, right? Yeah, very good. <laughs> All right, Ben Bradley, pleasure to have you. Thank you.